Um, my name is Dr. Hoberman, and I want to thank you for showing up, and I would like to thank the Gluten-Free Food Allergy Fest for, invi for inviting me to make this presentation. So, uh, the mission of this organization is something that I share strongly about. It's dedicating to meeting the needs of the celiac communities, those with gluten and food sensitivities, autoimmune, inflammatory disease, and autism. So having said all that, and here we are together, there's a reason you're here. So for many of you, do you have some of those problems that, that, are, that I'm outlining above? Some have celiac disease, some have gluten sensitivity. Okay, all right. Well, that's, that, I'm speaking to the right people then. Um, how I got here is that I'm board certified in internal medicine and gastroenterology and I was in doing gastroenterology for 25 years and now I do a health and wellness program which is more holistic. It's evaluating people for health issues or coming for a comprehensive exam and we look at all aspects of their health and it's interesting people have issues but so many of the issues they have are because of lifestyle. So our diet, our exercise, these are really critical parts of how we need to stay healthy. And for most people, they like to avoid taking medications that they can. And so diet has a lot to do with what about our health. Uh, what happened was, at doing gastroenterology for all those years, I would see people come in and they were having ongoing symptoms of bloating, gas, cramps, and diarrhea, and constipation and they were concerned that they may have some serious problem. Besides that, their quality of life was being impacted, and so they were looking for some relief. Well, we do a lot of different studies, and most times we could find an explanation for what was causing their problem, but there were a group of people that we couldn't identify what the issue was, and they got labeled irritable bowel syndrome. I never liked that term. Uh, it's a catch-all. It doesn't answer the question. And I'm sure if you're in this audience that, that somewhere along the line you may have been diagnosed with that before the correct diagnosis was made. So um, yeah, I would get frustrated because we weren't solving their problem. The patient uh, continued to have symptoms and I would see them in the grocery store and they were buying over-the-counter products like Gas-X. Well, Gas-X is cymethicone. All it does is changes the surface tension of a small gas bubble and makes it into a big gas bubble but you don't necessarily get rid of the gas unless you have a big belch, I guess. If the gas is, if it's somewhere else, it's not going to come out. So it doesn't really help. Uh, in about 2000, when I came to Health by Design, and I was having more of an opportunity to look holistically at people, there started to be published in the literature articles about importance of healthy bacteria in our intestinal tract. Up until that time, when I went to medical school and I did my training in gastroenterology, we never talked about the importance of healthy bacteria. We talked about bad bugs, what kind of illnesses they would cause, uh, how we could treat them, but nothing about the importance of healthy bacteria. And that all started about 2000, 2001, and they were called probiotics. And if you mention that word probiotics, people just looked at you and they had no idea what you were talking about. So I worked with a PhD microbiologist in 2005 and developed a probiotic called Endimmune. And uh, I've, it's been very gratifying for me. Uh, so anyway, today we're going to talk about celiac disease, symptoms, causes, treatment, and associated e extraintestinal disorders, uh, non-celiac gluten sensitivity, what we know and what we don't know, and also probiotics and the intestinal microbiome, their importance in managing GI disorders. So here is the culprit. These are all delicious baked goods, and uh, they're made up with flour from wheat and rye, and so they all contain the protein gluten in them. And here is a lining of the small intestines. It's got lots of folds in it, and it has these finger-like projections called villi, which increases the surface area. So the small intestines is about the size, of, area wise, of a football field, and that's really important for our digestion. Unfortunately, if you happen to have celiac disease, there is destruction of this lining, and the villi, instead of being like finger like projections, become blunted, and you decrease the surface area. So now, when you consume foods, 
you have malabsorption. You don't digest the proteins or the carbohydrates or a lot of the vitamins and minerals that are necessary, and you may end up with a lot of GI side effects. So that is what we're talking about today. Before I get into the begin talking about gluten, I just thought I'd mention a little bit about the grain. So here's a wheat field, there's the tassels, and here's the grain, and the bran is the outer cover of the grain, and it helps protect the grain. Uh, the germ is the embryo. This is what's going to be the next grain plant. So it's got some nutrients in it. And then most importantly is the endosperm because it has storage proteins and starches, and that's what's going to help that embryo grow and become another wheat plant. Unfortunately for a lot of people, it also contains gluten, the protein. So that is the problem. So what is gluten? Gluten is a protein composite of glutenin and gliadin that are found in wheat and rye and barley. Uh, they're storage proteins, so they're used to help the embryo grow. And gluten is derived from Latin, it means glue, and so it gives elasticity to dough, helping it to rise and keep its shape, and also the final product, a chewy texture. So there is a delicious bagel, and that's a classic uh, example of a gluten product. Now this next paragraph is a little more complex and it's important to understand though. So when we eat carbohydrates, they're made of chains of, 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 uh, carb of, of glucose. They're all brought together. And we have digestive enzymes that will break down so that only the glucose or fructose is absorbed. We t eat fat, well the fatty acids are broken down and they're absorbed. And when we eat proteins, we have enzymes that break down the proteins to the basic form, which is amino acids. So amino acids are what are absorbed. Now the particular problem for gluten, it has a very complex uh, bonding of some of the amino acids, so our digestive enzymes can't break them down. And so what we end up with is uh, a partially digested gluten fragment, and that is the problem. So this gluten fragment will interact with the lining cells and right here are proteins made by the lining cells that make it a tight junction. Nothing can get through. But when you break down that barrier, you have a leaky gut and that's the beginning of the issues because that exposes the protein to the, the immune system. Now this slide looks so complicated, but if you give me just two minutes of your time, uh, it'll make a lot of sense and you're going to learn a lot about celiac disease. So here is that fragment of protein. It's interacting with the lining cell. It releases this protein called zonulin. That acts on the lining cells, which is an enzyme, and it breaks down the bond. So that allows now the fragmented gluten protein to leak through, and they accumulate underneath the lining. This is where this is where the immune system is located in the small intestines. And what happens then is they accumulate and they stimulate the lining cell to release a uh, protein that's called transglutaminase, tissue transglutaminase. That's really important because tissue transglutaminase then will react with the fragment of gluten and that produces gliadin. So the combination of tissue transglutaminase and gliadin then will go and rest on this mast cell. This is an immune cell. Now the critical part is if you have celiac disease, you have to have a certain genetically inherited form of an HLA, human leukocyte antigen. We all have leukocyte antigens are on our uh, all our cells and what they're doing is are telling our, our immune system, I'm part of the self so don't mount an immune reaction against me. But for people with celiac disease, they have a variant of these HLA uh, proteins and so it causes a disturbance. So the combination of the gliadin, the tissue transglutaminase, and the HLA all set up right here and then the immune cells recognize that and what they do is they release all these inflammatory chemicals called cytokines. They stimulate the plasma cells to make antibodies called IgA and IgG. And it's against the tissue transglutaminase. So that, in a short story, is what celiac disease is about. So now we're talking about the leaky gut. So now we have a breakdown of the, of the, of the, of the uh, lining or the barrier of the intestines. Things get through. It's not supposed to happen. 
So now uh, bacteria, uh, yeast, um, proteins of food, and uh, other products can get through that normally don't get through and it will impact our immune system, which then impacts us. So stress is another factor which breaks down the intestinal barrier. Stress works on the, our intestinal bacteria, and the intestinal bacteria, the good ones, help to maintain that tight junction proteins. So when you break that down with stress, or antibiotics, or other anti-cancer drugs, radiation therapy, uh, a variety of things, you'll lose that barrier and things leak through. Well, that then stimulates the immune system. We get food allergies and uh, we end up with affecting our brain barrier and we have psychological and neurological disorders. So the definition of celiac disease is an autoimmune inflammatory disorder of the small intestines that's precipitated by the ingestion of gluten, which is a component of wheat protein, in genetically susceptible people. Okay? The incidence is about one in a hundred in the United States. So we got about 3.1 million people walking around with celiac disease, but 83% have never been diagnosed with it or they've been misdiagnosed, and people struggle. And they're often labeled irritable bowel syndrome. Well, the pathophysiology is what I said. The autoimmunity and the gluten-induced enteropathy involves intestinal plasma cells which produce IgA and IgG antibodies to tissue transglutaminase, which is in the cell. And it's, that is the autoantibody that causes the disorder. So what's going on? Why do some people develop celiac disease? Well, it's a three-legged stool. It's environment, or in the intake of gluten. Two, it's genetics. And three, a precipitating event. So, in the environment, when we were uh, hunter and gatherers, we had no grains. And we didn't have celiac disease. And we didn't have food allergies. So, about 12,000 years ago, we had the agricultural revolution, and we started introducing new proteins that, for most of us, we were able to adapt to. But some didn't have the ability. They developed food intolerances, and they would also uh, develop celiac disease. So that was the beginning, once we had grains. Genetics. So you can't have this disorder of celiac disease unless you have one or both of these inherited uh, HLA proteins that are really important to present to the immune system to cause the problem. Uh, there, these HLA proteins are part of our uh, matching process. So if, if someone wants to don a kid, donate a kidney and the recipient, they check to see what their HLAs are like and the closer they are, the better likely there's going to be a match. So it has a lot to do with our immune system. So the, as I said before, they adhere to the macrophage, they present the gluten protein to the immune cells, and then we develop the tissue transglutaminase antibodies. One more time, here's the lumen, here's the gl gluten protein. It's broken down in the lumen by the digestive enzymes to the fragment. The fragment gets through the lining. It then interacts with uh, tissue transglutaminase. So tissue transglutaminase changes the gluten to gliadin. So gliadin and the trans uh, tissue transglutaminase come up here. They get on the uh, macrophage and they bind up with the HLA and now you've got it all set up so the immune cells can interact and cause the damage. So the precipitating event. Some people uh, at genetic risk for celiac disease don't develop the disorder or they develop it early in life or they develop later in life. And I believe the hypothesis is that it's due to an event that caused an increased intestinal permeability. So, for example, uh, you could have a bout of acute gastroenteritis. It could be due to virus or bacteria. It broke down the barrier. It allowed the gluten to get through. Someone's already genetically at risk for it and it allows it to develop. Uh, you could have disruption of the healthy bacteria. Then you got, again, breakdown of the intestinal barrier. 
and you're going to end up with getting celiac disease if you genetically were predisposed to it. So I'm going to give you an example. There's a nurse that works in our office. She, at the age of 22, was fine, and then she had a bout of gastroenteritis, and after that, it took a while for her to get better, but she kept having recurrent bouts of pain that bad. I mean, she went to the emergency room, and they couldn't find out the cause of her symptoms. She went to her primary care doctor. He gave her some therapies to see if it would get better. It never got better. So she went and saw a gastroenterologist and ended up having the right test done, and she was found to have celiac disease. And she's fine now. She's 28, and she's having her second baby. But her mother uh, has Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which is a problem with the thyroid gland. It's an autoimmune disease. It happens in people with celiac disease. And in addition, the mother has some GI issues, but they weren't really bad, so she never went to a doctor. But because of her da daughter's experience and the genetic factor, she went and got evaluated. And sure enough, she has celiac disease, and she's been on a gluten-free diet, and she didn't realize how good she would feel if she was on the diet. She had GI symptoms, she just kind of lived with it and thought that was the normal part of life, but it really changed her whole life. But it wouldn't happen if her daughter hadn't had gotten such a, uh, some problem. So it's sort of showing you the spectrum of the disease. It can be mild, and you may never go to the doctor, or it may not you know, be pretty bad, and then, then you end up getting diagnosed early. So this slide, again, shows the gluten breaking through, lying on the macrophage, producing the antibodies, and destroying the lining of the intestines. Here is what is the spectrum of the disease. This is a normal villus. It's got a lot of surface area, and it does fine. As you progress with celiac disease, you lose the villus, and now you're going to have trouble absorbing almost everything. Not only uh, proteins and starches and fat, but also you'll have problems with the nutrients, which are really critical. So this slide is sort of like an iceberg phenomenon. You can have the genetic put com a component of it. You may be okay until you have a precipitating event. Then you start to have the breakdown of the intestines, and eventually it surfaces to the point where you're going to get evaluated. So these are other nutriments that people will have that have celiac disease that are while they're still taking uh, gluten. Iron, calcium, and vitamin D are very common. Vitamin B12, copper, folate, magnesium, niacin, riboflavin, and zinc also occur. So what happens, for example, somebody doesn't feel well, they're kind of lost their energy, they, don't, they end up going to the doctor, the doctor gets a blood test, and they're found to be anemic, and then they do more testing, and it's found to be due to iron deficiency, vitamin B12, and then that raises the suspicion, is there a problem with absorption in the diet up until, because they may have not presented with a lot of GI issues, they were but they were complaining because they were fatigued and they had anemia. So that's how the diagnosis was made, because with all those deficiencies, there had to be something going on in the GI tract. Another situation is where somebody falls down and breaks a hip. They're kind of young, they have a hip fracture, they get evaluated, they're found to have osteoporosis, and that's due to the deficiency in the ability to absorb vitamin D and calcium. That's critical for people who have intestinal disorders to make sure they get sufficient amount. And so they, that may be how they backed into getting diagnosed with celiac disease. Again, it not, may not have been because of GI symptoms. These are interesting uh, things that will happen if you have these deficiencies. And it's sort of kind of dementia, diarrhea, and dermatitis for niacin. Riboflavin leads to uh, subarea dermatitis, uh, anemia. Zinc leads to growth and development problems, loss of appetite. Copper leads to fatigue, anemia. They're all just vague uh, symptoms that anybody could have. And if you go to the doctor and you say you have these symptoms, it's not going to be on the differential to think about celiac disease unless they measured something to say, well, gee, you're really deficient in this. So it's a lot of, that's part of the reason 83% of the people aren't diagnosed. They don't have all the classic symptoms. They, they present with different, different symptoms. There are also the neurological and psychological problems that are associated with celiac disease. Peripheral neuropathy is often due to B12 deficiency or copper. 
That may be the reason you go to the neurologist. The neurologist knows enough to check for celiac disease. Cerebellar ataxia, cerebellum is in the brain and that con controls our uh, coordination. So we have to have a muscle coordination to get our hand to our mouth. When we walk, uh, we have to have a special gait and the cerebellum helps to coordinate all that. And in celiac disease, there is a, some people will develop an immune reaction because there's a breakdown of the blood bra brain barrier and it damages the cerebellum and then they have those kinds of issues. And again, it's a neurological problem and you hope the neurologist is going to identify it because they can get better if they're on a gluten-free diet. Now the next list is just all everyday common problems that you see all the time. Migraines, depression, anxiety, irritability, dementia, seizures. This can happen to anybody, not necessarily with celiac disease, but you got to put it in the differential because if it is related to celiac disease and you do the right test and find it, these people really get dramatically better when they're on a gluten-free diet. Even autism is associated with it. So correcting the nutritional deficiencies and getting the right diet makes a huge difference. This is the autoimmune diseases. So this is an autoimmune dis disorder. You've already in, uh, changed the, the, uh, the cells and things are leaking through and now you can develop other antibodies. So type 1 diabetes occurs in a fair amount of people with celiac disease, multiple sclerosis, Hashimoto's thyroiditis that leads to underactive thyroid. In this room, all those who have an underactive thyroid, raise your hand. Isn't that amazing? It's just part of the spectrum. Autoimmune hepatitis, Addison's disease is adrenal insufficiency, Arthritis, I'm not talking about osteoarthritis, I'm talking about rheumatoid arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, it's just part of the spectrum. Sjogren's syndrome is when there's destruction of the lacrimal glands so you don't make tears, and it's also destruction of the salivary glands so you don't make saliva, so there's a dryness. And again, if you go to the rheumatologist and they figure that's what you have, because there's blood tests you can do for it, they're going to think about also checking for celiac disease because they know it's associated with it. This is very interesting. Dermatitis or pediformis. So this is a skin disorder. Anybody ever has dermatitis or pediformis? Okay. So this is specific for celiac disease. It's a blistering, itchy rash. It can occur anywhere on the body. And you don't get this unless you have celiac disease. And about 10% of people who have celiac disease, they'll get dermatitis or pediformis as an adult. And those who have dermatitis or pediformis, only 20% will have any GI issues. So they present, hopefully, to the dermatologist. The dermatologist will biopsy, make the studies done. And what it is, it's a immune-mediated reaction against the tissue transglutaminase, because it's not just in the intestinal tract, but this enzyme is in all the tissues, and so what happens, an IgA antibody attacks the tissue transglutaminase in the skin, and it causes a reaction. And the treatment is a gluten-free diet, and they get better. Amazing. There is also a small risk of small intestinal cancers, adenocarcinoma, and lymphoma, and also possible pharyngeal and esophageal cancers. They're very uncommon. And the earlier that you're diagnosed with uh, gluten uh, sensitivity or celiac disease and you're put on uh, uh, the right diet, the, your risk becomes less. But if it's a longer time, your risk becomes a somewhat of a, an, of a concern. And so for the physician, they have to keep in the back of their mind when they're seeing patients with celiac disease, if all of a sudden the person's following the diet really well and they got more abdominal pain or they have problems with swallowing, then you have to think, could they have this complication? And you have to go look for it. So the diagnosis is a blood test. Before we always had to do biopsies, but this tissue transglutaminase, which I've already mentioned a lot of times, there is, uh, if you do the blood test looking for the antibody, it's not percent, the 98% who have celiac disease will have a positive test. 
So that means if there's 100 people and you test them, 2% will be missed. Well, that's a very high sensitivity rate. On the other hand, if you're healthy and you do this test, 95% will be negative. Only 5% will have a false positive. So again, you're really identifying the patient for the most part. When there's some question of what's going on, we do have other tests that can be done. And bottom line, I'm going to go to the bottom slide because the diagnosis is going to be made with a biopsy of the small intestines. That's an endoscopy. Uh, many of you probably know it's a, not much more than a 15-minute test. It's not that invasive, but the, just getting some little samples of the lining of the small intestines, you can make the diagnosis. And or if someone's having problems and you're not you're concerned if, if they're on a gluten-free diet, you can biopsy it just to see if they're having a problem or if it's doing well. Children less than two years old, you don't want to do invasive procedures. So again, you can use a blood test and it'll diagnose it. And the treatment for celiac disease, as you know, is a gluten-free diet. So non-celiac gluten sensitivity. This is a very interesting area. So there were people who had GI issues and they, would, they couldn't figure it out. Sometimes they'd go to the doctor and the doctor would do different tests. They could even test for celiac disease and it would be negative. And the person said, well, gee, it seems like when I eat wheat products, I get problems. And again, the doctor would say, well, we did all these tests. You don't have a gluten problem because the blood tests are all negative. The biopsies are negative. And so they learn on their own that they had a gluten sensitivity. And in the grocery stores, the, the food manufacturers also recognize that there was a problem because in the aisles now, there are aisles and aisles, and we have here lots of people who make food for gluten people who have gluten sensitivity. So what happened was in 2011, there was too much of this going on, so there was an international meeting in London where experts got together and they said, okay, we have to come up with a definition for this disorder. Too many people have it. So it's an, they came up and said, non-celiac gluten sensitivity is a non-allergic, non-autoimmune condition in which the consumption of gluten leads to similar, symptoms similar to those seen in celiac disease. Now that's sort of a cop-out to me because it really doesn't say much. Okay? And as it turns out, as we're learning more, there are some subtle immune changes that are, going, that are being found. You just know that it has to be more to than just saying that. There, there's got to be something more to the problem. So this is a spectrum of disorders. There are people who have wheat sensitivity, they can have celiac disease, they can have non-gluten, non-celiac gluten sensitivity, there's no abnormalities on the biopsies, they don't have the positive antibody test, uh, but they can have all the similar symptoms of people who have celiac disease and they get better if they're on a gluten-free diet. Then there is a group of people just like people who have peanut allergies or shellfish allergies, you can develop a specific IgE antibody to uh, gluten. And that's like here now we're dealing with cedar allergies. Well, there's an antibody to cedar. If you go to the allergist, they can do skin testing with IgE to see if you've got an uh, immune reaction to it. And that, the allergist can do that. And if you're positive, then it's again a matter of staying off the gluten because you'll have sneezing, itchy eyes, all the things you would get with some uh, form of allergy related to IgE. So the diagnosis of uh, non-celiac gluten sensitivity, yeah, the symptoms are triggered by the ingestion of gluten. There's absence of biomarkers. All these are negative. 50% of people with non-celiac gluten sensitivity have the HLA uh, uh, antigens present, but so does 35% of normal people, so it's not a very good marker. But again, it kind of raises the suspicion. Maybe there's something immune going on that we don't recognize. How do you resolve this issue? Well, if you stop taking gluten, your symptoms go away. If you start taking gluten, your symptoms come back. They did a study on people who said they had gluten sensitivity and they all were on a gluten-free diet. Half of them got capsules which had a placebo. The other half got capsules that had gluten. They had them keep a diary for six weeks 
And the group that had, uh, were getting the gluten capsules had a lot of symptoms and the group that were on the placebo had very few symptoms. That's about as scientific as we've gotten as doing that kind of study. We don't have any better way of diagnosing it other than getting off of it. I saw a lady in the office the other day and she came in because she was interested in the probiotic. We talked about it, she tried it, she didn't get better. We started talking about gluten. I said, well, have you ever thought about gluten sensitivity? She said, yeah, I did. And actually I felt better for a couple days, but it was hard to stay on it, so I got off of it. So then I explained to her, this is something that she's got to live with because it did change her. The prevalence is variable. And there's surveys that have been done and in the po general population is thought to be maybe one to six percent. Now that's several years ago. People are recognizing it more and more. We have these big conventions and I would say that that's a higher number. Then if you take the subpopulation of those people walking around with IBS, 30 percent of those have for sure gluten sensitivity. So it's a big deal. You got to think about it and then it's the making the decision you're going to stay on the diet because you got to stay on it for sometimes weeks until you get resolution of your symptoms. It may not happen overnight and it's fascinating because it's not just the GI symptoms, it's all the other manifestations, the foggy brain, the achiness, the joint issues that all get better once you get off of gluten. And that makes you think that there's got to be an autoimmune disorder because too many things are being involved. We just haven't identified it. Well, the therapy right now is the same as a gluten-free diet. I'm going to talk about the intestinal microbiome. Let me just tell you, there are lots of research going down that's happening now. They're modifying gluten so that it won't, uh, that, it will, that it will be broken down so that you won't have this partially fragmented, and that will make a difference. They have antibodies to tissue transglutaminase so you can stop it. They have developed antibodies to zonulin, that protein that that caused the, the breakdown of the type barrier. And they're working on so many different areas for this disorder that in the future there may be certain medications you can take that would help if, and you may not have to quite follow a gluten-free diet. But there's a lot of research being done now. So uh, as far as probiotics, the term is derived from Greek and it means for life. And uh, it contains, most of the bacteria are coming from the human intestinal tract. The, and they have been selected because they have certain criteria. There's one that's a yeast that shows that it has benefit. So down here we talk about the good guys and the bad guys. Uh, and the criteria, if you're going to be tested to see whether you're a bacteria that can be a probiotic, well you have to have certain criteria. You have to survive the acid of the stomach. You can't be broken down by the digestive enzymes or the bile acids and that you adhere to the intestinal lining. So for years people told me about how yogurt made them feel better or it was a good idea to take yogurt. Well there's two bacteria that start to make yogurt. Uh, but those two bacteria you can't recover in yogurt. So Dannon makes Activia because they add a, a probiotic to it. So yogurt's fine. If you want to eat yogurt it's got calcium, it's got uh, protein in it, but it's not a good probiotic. And also, the, finally, it can't be harmful. So if you meet that criteria, then the bacteria have to be studied in cell cultures and along intestinal lining uh, and outside the human body. If it shows that it has benefit, then if it can be tested in animals, if it looks like it's got some benefit, then you move on to the third phase, where by this time the pharmaceutical companies may have spent $50 million, and then you develop studies in humans and prove that it's beneficial, and then you have a probiotic. So what do they do? There's 100 trillion, these are some facts about the intestinal bacteria. There is 100 trillion bacteria in our intestinal tract. Most of them reside in the colon, but they're also in the small bowel. Most of them are beneficial, but some are harmful. And the probiotics help to maintain the balance so the good guys are in control. So they help in uh, our digestion, in our in keeping our stool habits regular. They maintain our health. They kill the bad guys. So if you're traveling and you're going to a third world country and where the, you're worried about food contamination, or we have these outbreaks all the time in the United States with food products are recalled. I and mean, look what happened to Blue Bale so, uh, with Listeria. So the whole point is, if you have on board probiotic bacteria, 
they able, they're able to destroy harmful bacteria and there's lots of studies that have shown that when you travel uh, people do better. I just had a patient come in that he and his family went to Bolivia, they went down the Amazon, they were with a group of people of 30 people, only his family were taking Endimmune, everybody else on the boat got sick because they were eating the native food as they traveled so I'm sure they got the same bacteria that everybody else got but they didn't get sick because of it. So when we're born we've been swimming around the amniotic fluid, we're in a sterile environment and then we pass through the vaginal canal and we're exposed to our mother's bacteria. That's our first exposure and that gives us the bacteria that are really important for our health. When they do studies on mice that are kept germ-free and they sacrifice them, the immune cells never develop and the lining cells never mature. So there is this interaction between the bacteria and our uh, lining cells and our immune system that's really critical. So there's a little baby, it's got the bacteria from the mother and it's ingested some of them. So we pick up the first bacteria which was really critical is bifidobacteria. And uh, it, is, it, it is really critical because this bifidobacteria has a symbiotic relationship. Uh, it's, it will break down a starch that's in breast milk that is resistant to being broken down. In other words, our enzymes can't break down this starch. So it gets in the colon, and in the colon, the, the breast milk starch gives nourishment to the bifidobacteria. They start to proliferate, and then they, in the process of fermentation, produce short-chain fatty acids, which are very important for our health, and we'll talk about it in a minute. So one of the things that short-chain fatty acids are, they produce nourishment for the colon lining cells, which is critical, and they also ha have an effect on the harvesting of calories. So, uh, so this symbiotic relationship exists, and uh, when we're born and we have no bacteria, we, get, we start to have some, and then the baby's crawling around on the ground, puts its hands to its mouth, it picks up more bacteria, and depending where it lives, uh, if, if there's food that's on the ground, in our Western society, we don't let the children eat that, and so we're restricted on some bacteria. In some countries, they eat a lot of things that they're exposed to, and there turns out there's hygiene theory that when, we're, when we were living in caves and we were exposed to viruses, bacteria, and parasites, our immune system was very active. It was having to determine what's coming in as friendly or foe and, and develop an immune reaction to it. Well, we live in a hygienic environment now, and so we're not constantly being exposed to it, and so um, we, we have an opportunity to make antibodies against innocuous food proteins. People get allergies, they get eczema, they have all kinds of problems. And in children that are born by C-section versus a normal vaginal delivery by age five, their immune system is different because they didn't have the normal exposure during that very important infancy time. So they have more problems with eczema, allergies, uh, autism, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, other health issues. So if you start to give children at a very young age a probiotic, they're less likely to have that. And now even some OBs have taken vaginal swabs and have given it to the newborns that were born by C-section so they get some of those important bacteria. Really interesting. Never would have thought of that. So there, if you go around and just sample everybody, there's probably a thousand different species of bacteria that we have in our intestinal tract. But each species, say it's like a species of Ford. Well, Ford has a whole bunch of models. So under species, we have strains. So we have more than one. So we, a lactobacillus acidophilus is a probiotic. But there are lots of different strains, and so they're all not identical. Um, and so most of us only have around four or five hundred different bacteria. There's a core of 30 or 40 that are critical that we develop when we're very young. And we keep that same uh, bacteria flora and uh, it's, it gets stable at age three and then remains that way until we get up into our 65 or 70 years of age. And then we start to lose diversity because our immune system is changing and we have less of the healthy balance which then leads to dysbiosis, which causes an, intolerance, uh, uh, an imbalance and overgrowth of unhealthy bacteria. 
Uh, we get chronic intestinal inflammation, increased permeability, and disruption of normal intestinal digestion, and it leads to a lot of the issues that sometimes we have as we get older. Taking a probiotic will help to prevent a lot of that problems. So this is just a slide showing you that if you drink too much alcohol, you're stressed, you don't eat healthy, you travel a lot, you uh, take antibiotics and non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs which break down the barrier, that's going to have an impact on creating a, a, a disruption of the healthy bacteria. Then we start to feel bloated and we feel bad. Down here, the gut becomes inflamed, we have more symptoms, we develop a leaky gut, and then we have food intolerances, other immune reactions like um, psoriasis. Um, another skin condition is uh, seborrheic dermatitis and um, acne, uh, uh, not vulgaris, but acne uh, erythematous, where if you take a probiotic, it will help to improve it because it's really changing the ba balance. So I want to mention what prebiotics. Now you've all heard the term prebiotics, I guess. So prebiotics are resistant starches. So they're not broken down by our intestinal lining. And they're critical because they're going to feed the healthy bacteria. They help to maintain the uh, uh, good bacteria in the intestinal tract. So they're called the super starches. And they, again, help the probiotic bacteria uh, produce the short chain fatty acids. And so butyrate, for example, it feeds the colon lining cells. Let's say you got an antibiotic. Somewhere along the line, when you, get, when you take an antibiotic, you're at risk for developing diarrhea because you wiped out the healthy bacteria. You're not producing butyrate. So normally, as butyrate is produced, it's absorbed by the colon lining cells, and it acts as a solvent drag. It brings water and electrolytes into the cell also. So when you don't have butyrate, you don't absorb the water and electrolytes, and you have diarrhea. So p doctors have learned to say, okay, you're going to be on this antibiotic, but I want you to take a probiotic because it will maintain the bacteria that produce butyrate and people don't get diarrhea. That's one of the big things that helps. It's a big problem for children. Propionate is absorbed and it has an effect on where the calories go. It has an effect on um, our uh, uh, the risk of diabetes, helping to lessen that risk. And we have acetate, which is directs where the energy goes to our muscle cells. And when you take someone who is obese and um, transplant into them stool from healthy, lean individuals and change the bacteria flora, the individual will start, to, the heavy person will start to lose weight and if they had diabetes, their glucose intolerance will improve because the bacteria have an impact through the short chain fatty acids. Pretty amazing information. Uh, so here are some resistant starches. This is, uh, this is potato starch. You can use it instead of corn starch. Uh, th these are green bananas. Nobody's going to eat green bananas. But if you take a potato, for example, and you cook a potato, and you boiled it, and if you put it in the refrigerator and let it get cold, it causes crystallization of the bonding of the carbohydrates, and then they become resistant starches, and it can be used by the bacteria. If you eat asparagus or uh, broccoli, um, onions, garlic, artichokes, they have resistant starches, and they help to improve our health. And so do the lentils. So how do probiotics work? They act as an intestinal barrier. They modulate the intestinal immune response. They support intestinal function and motility. So as an intestinal barrier, they adhere to the intestinal lining cells. They compete for colonization against the bad bugs. They produce bacteria or defenses, which are proteins, which will destroy the harmful bacteria. They change the pH in the lumen to make it more of an acid environment. So if you ingest E. coli, salmonella, campylobacter, an acid environment is unfriendly to them and they don't survive. Uh, it produces pain, main, uh, proteins to maintain that type junction protein so you don't have a leaky gut. And they stimulate mucus production. And so this is a slide that shows what I'm talking about. So here are the probiotics that are sitting on the mucus layer of the lining cells. They stimulate the lining cells to produce the mucus layer. 
and also they produce these bactericins which are proteins they are like bullets. They pierce the viruses and the bacteria and destroy them. Uh, here is one of the most important things they do. They stimulate the lining cells to produce the protein. So you see those little black lines. That's the proteins that maintain the tight junction so nothing leaks through. So having the right balance of bacteria is really important. And they modulate the immune system. 70% of the immune system is in the gut because it's a window to our environment. Uh, they stimulate the function and development of the immune system. And they, um, they help the immune system does a surveillance of what's coming in. It decides if it's friendly or bad. So that's when kids are growing up, when they're deciding what bacteria they're going to keep in their gut. And the probiotics cross talk with the immune system and help to regulate the inflammation. So here is a slide that explains that. So here are the intestinal lining cells. Now we're talking about what goes on underneath the lining. This is where the immune systems reside. So this is an immune cell that sends a branch up through the lining to check to see what's in the intestinal tract, decide whether there's good bacteria or bad bacteria. If it's a good bacteria, it sends a message to the immune cell saying don't create any immune mediated reaction, don't cause inflammation, everything is okay. But then if there's a bad bug up here or if there's a dysregulation and there are a lot of bad bugs, then it sends a message to the immune cells and it says you got to create an immune mediated reaction to try to get things back in balance. But during that period of time, we have a lot of GI issues until there's a rebalance by taking a probiotic. So here is, in summary, what happens. Somebody ingests a probiotic, it escapes the acid of the stomach, it's not destroyed by the bile acids, digestive enzymes, or the pancreatic enzymes. It moves through the small intestines and it adheres to the intestinal lining of the small intestines and colon, and it produces a short chain fatty acids to help maintain our health. So this last slide is to show you some of the things that we found that what the, the bacteria have been shown to do in clinical studies. They ease the symptoms of irritable bowel syndrome, they lessen the risk of antibiotic associated diarrhea, enhance the immune system. So when they give it to children going to daycare centers, they got a probiotic or they got a placebo, the children they got the probiotic during the cold and flu season, there was a 50% reduction in cold and flu symptoms. They went, there was less absence from school and less need of antibiotics. It just shows how it so impacts the immune system. It, le it lessens the risk of infectious diarrhea. And as I mentioned, traveler's diarrhea helps to remain the, maintain the remission in ulcerative colitis. Uh, lessens the risk for obesity. Improves blood sugar control and less is the risk for cardiovascular disease. There's a lot of new studies that are showing how the probiotics help to lessen the risk for that and improves the gut brain barrier. So the gut is considered the second brain. It has a lot of serotonin, a lot of dopamine in it, and when there's a disruption, uh, it can lead to problems with anxiety or stress. If you get a rebalance, you can lessen those problems and it improves the autism spectrum disorder. So these are some of the probiotics that are out there. And so uh, Activa, you, you've heard of a line you see advertised a lot. And there is Endimmune at the bottom. So most, most of these are made up of one or two uh, probiotics. And this is how many is in a serving size. I developed Endimmune because I knew that it takes more than one or two bugs to do all the things I just explained to you. They all can't do the fermentation and the immune system and uh, maintain the tight junction barrier. So it takes more than a, one bacteria. That's the reason Endimmune has uh, this a group of bacteria that are able to uh, have a benefit overall. In addition, when the studies are done, it takes at least 10 billion of the good guys to make a difference. So that's the reason each uh, serving size of the Endimmune in the adult form has 20 billion. Well, that is my talk, and so I had asked you to hold any questions till the end of it. Now, I hope I didn't confuse anybody, or maybe I stimulated a few questions. So if you have any questions, please ask me. Great. Yes. Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. The question was, if you have 
damage to the intestinal lining with the, uh, the villi being foreshortened. And, you know, if it's related to the celiac disease, certainly you've got to be on a gluten-free diet. But by also having the right balance of bacteria, it helps to maintain that healthy balance and also the, the, the tight junction barrier. Any other questions? Can you get uh, probiotics in food? Can you get probiotics what? In food? In food? Well, yogurt. Uh, and, but the problem is when you do it in food, a probiotic, uh, like this has a shelf life. It's been nitrogen flush, there's no oxygen, there's no moisture to it, so it's good for two years. If you take it a food, it's all different. You got moisture, it's got heat, you have other things, and it can't last that long. You, you can do it, but it's not going to be as, a, as effective, and they're not going to have as many bugs in them. They just aren't in food. I think you should take, no, it, you can take it any time of the day. Uh, in Endimmune, the, it has a capsule that is acid resistant. So you can take it pretty much other, any time. But most probiotics don't have this acid resistant capsule. So you want to take it when the acid level is low so the acid won't destroy the bacteria. So take it with a meal. When you take a meal, th that will buffer any of the acid being produced. So it's low during that time. Or take it just before you eat. That's the best time. The acid is highest like one or two hours after you eat a meal. You don't know anything about probiotics or endomune? Oh, endomune. Endomune, it, first of all, there's, there's a site, endomune.com. That's a website. And you can buy it online. You can buy it um, on Amazon. Or there's a list all the retail outlets. So you live here in Austin? Pardon? Georgetown. Georgetown. Um, if you go on the website, it'll tell you where there are stores near Georgetown. There's lots and lots of stores here in, San, uh, in Austin that has it. It's in many of the HEB stores. It's in the Central Market here. So uh, there's an, it's in People's Pharmacy. Um, there's quite a few places that you can buy it. Do I think it's the best way to get probiotics into your body? Well, first of all, I'm going to have a bias here because I developed it. But yes, I think it's the best way to get it in. Yes, absolutely. And it's just amazing how many people will send in unsolicited um, uh, comments of how it made such a difference in their life and how thankful they are. So it, it's, a, it's a big deal that for a lot of people that struggle. Usually it takes like six weeks for you to see the, really the healing. And then it's really interesting, not only the GI issues, but all these extra intestinal symptoms get better. All of a sudden you don't have the joint aching and all the other kind of effects that you have. It's, it's amazing how people get better. Yes, please. Can the pro probiotics affect cerebellar ataxia? There's no study that I've seen that shows it makes a difference for that. No. Any other questions? Yes. Are you selling that over here? Yes. Uh huh. The booth is over um, towards the front, and you'll see it. Yes. If you uh, don't have any symptoms, but you take your supplements and whatnot, just to try to stay healthy. That's it. A lot of people ask me if I really don't have a lot of GI issues or any benefit in taking a probiotic. Well, there are studies out there that really show that one of the things that happens in our Western diet is that we have a lot more colon cancer. If you go to third world countries, they just don't have the colon cancer. Our diet is made up of so much of meat products and the fat. Those are potential carcinogens. And so that's due to the bacteria which will break down and produce that. And it's been shown that probiotics will decrease 
the, those kinds of carcinogens and it's not been proved but the idea is that yes if you're healthy you want to stay healthy that's one of the reasons to do it plus you're constantly being exposed to things you could have had some blue bell ice cream they had listeria and it hopefully would have prevented you from getting sick so taking it on a daily basis really can make difference for lots of people yes so I see three different uh, labels there can you explain the difference so this is so I developed the adult and then people say, well, I really think I'd like to have a children's one because they have problems. They, they go to, they, like they get ear infections, they get antibiotics, they get really sick. So we developed this one down here. This is a powder form with a little uh, spoon and that's for the little, little ones. By age three, they don't want powder anymore. So everybody wants chewable. So this is for the age group three to eight. Yeah. But it's interesting. When you look at this, they're different than, than the adult because it has much more bifidobacteria because from the slides, I showed you how important the bifidobacteria are for children growing up in that they break down the resistant starches and they make all these short chain fatty acids that's very important for the development of the immune system. So they'll, you'll see a variation in the type of bacteria that are used for children first than adults. Okay, so what happens is that starches are made up of long chains of carbohydrates, which are glucose, and they're, they're bind, the, the carbon bound. bind. Uh, there are branches in, in these uh, carbon chains, and we have enzymes that can break down, but there are some enzymes that are la lacking, and we can't break down that, that, that branch chain. So they are resistant to our ability to digest them. So they move on through and they get to the colon and then that's when they become uh, resistant starches and they're used. Because they are the nourishment for the healthy bacteria. So the healthy bacteria are maintained. So when we don't eat some of the healthy starches, if you eat a lot of fruits and vegetables, you're going to get resistant starches. You know, there, there's, some of them are wrapped around in cellulose, which is, we don't have the enzyme to break it down. So it gets into our colon and the bacteria do it. It's interesting, if you go to Japan, since Japan liked to eat seaweed, we don't have the bacteria to break down seaweed. But the Japanese evolved and they've got bacteria to break down seaweed. It's just amazing how the diet will affect it.